All right, we got 50 people here, and we've got a lot of stuff to cover. So what? I say we just go for it. You ready, Wolfie? What, 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 what time do you have, Tom? It's six o'clock Central Time. Seven o'clock. Okay. Your time. All right. Um, can I say two things before you get started? Um, actually, I, I sent you an outline, and you can say, you know okay. what? Go ahead. Inform Listen, I, I, just on a housekeeping note, it's, it's very helpful if everyone on the call puts their phones on mute, and unless you're talking and asking a question. Otherwise, we'll get a whole bunch of feedback. The second thing was that I just want to make a big shout out for to both Tom and to Joe, especially to Joe, Dr. Warrath, because he spent a crazy amount of time and effort piecing a lot of, a lot of these protocols together and spent an awful lot of time um, getting this course together for everyone. And so just a big shout out and thank you to, to you guys. That's it, Tom. Okay. Thank you, sir. And we may come back to you shortly. Um, so let's reiterate that you should hit mute. I think everybody has now. So, uh, and then you know the way Zoom works. You can chat, you can raise your hand. There's all kinds of ways um, to chime in. Uh, hope everybody's safe. Hope you're thinking about getting your offices open. I'm not here to try to talk you into it or out of it. I saw some things going on on GOA Net that were uh, very exciting. Almost reminded us of the days when we were fighting about board certification. Um, hopefully people are rested. Hope they're not overly stressed out about all the things going on business-wise and health-wise. Um, what we're going to do tonight is we will start. Uh, we're going to uh, have Jonathan say hello. That's happened. Um, Lauren's going to give us a GOA update in just a minute. Uh, Gavin, um, Gavin Myers. Um, is uh, our in-house attorney. I think his title, that I don't think he knows his title yet, but is Director of Strategic Development, if Jonathan and I agree on that. Did you like that title, Jonathan? Yeah, that's good. Okay, very good. Thanks for the enthusiasm. Um, and then uh, our keynote address will be Joe Walrath on how to reopen our offices oh safely. Oh my God. Our what? Um. Somebody needs to pot to, uh, <laughs> to mute. Oh. Okay, so let's bring Lauren on to talk to us um, about stuff that's uh, going on with the GOA. Lauren Dyack. I wanted to make this as real as possible, so I'm grabbing my karaoke microphone. So it's like I'm presenting to y'all in person. Like Tom said, we hope that you're doing well and getting excited to uh, go back to patient care. Um, I am. I actually serve on the Georgia Optometric Association as the Board of Trustee member for the 5th District. The GOA in particular, our president, Dr. Murdad Sadat, as well as Brian Markowitz, have been very proactive and great about communicating updates regarding COVID-19, PPP, and the CDC guidelines. I encourage everyone to not only join the GOA, but also take a look at their website for frequent updates regarding the sensitive and fluid situation. As you all probably saw, the GOA Summer Conference has been postponed to next year. It's gonna remain at the scheduled resort, which is Wild Dunes Resort on the Isle of Palm, South Carolina. As of now, the fall conference is still scheduled to be in Athens. We expect it to be larger in scale compared to previous years, and certainly we hope to see you all there. Due to this pandemic, the continuing education requirements have become a little more lax. There are plenty of options to get live CE online nowadays. Check out SECO University as they have lots of possibilities. So also get the percentage of the access fee. So you're supporting our state organization by going through SECO University for your online CE needs. So basically, it's a win-win. With that said, would Dr. Sadat or Dr. Perrine like to say anything? I hope everyone is safe and well, and I know we are looking forward to going back to work soon because everybody's probably super bored, and you can only clean out so many drawers and, you know, clean up the kitchen so many times before you're looking for something else to do. So looking forward to seeing everyone soon again whether it's uh, on another Zoom call or wherever we are. So uh, good luck to everyone and uh, be safe and well. 
Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I, I, would, uh, I would echo all the sentiments and, and comments that have already been made. Um, for those of you who know, uh, we have a great team at the GOA office and we have been working diligently. Um, our, our organization sat up till 10, 30, 11 o'clock one night and then Brian and I stayed on the call till about one o'clock in the morning getting some, some guidelines written to give to Governor Kemp and then they implemented those per our order direct. Um, so we've done a, a great job with our organization, making sure that we are at the helm of how these things are getting taken care of for the better of optometry. And um, I would say that I can't do it without the good team that we have at the GOA. I mean, Dr. Prine has been a wonderful help to us throughout and giving guidance and, and, and uh, I, I'm just at a loss. You know, it, you, you know elite, people are telling me thank you and, and giving me you know, kudos for the leadership, but it's not me. It's, it's a great team that we've assembled over the years. And I give credit to everybody involved and I'm just thankful that we have uh, weathered this storm fairly well, we'll continue to do well, and uh, we'll get past this. All right, everybody for those mute their microphone except whoever's speaking because I hear some rodents scur scurrying around. Um, Jonathan is no longer visible. Did anybody take a look at him before he took his picture off? He fell off the treadmill. I saw it happen. It was like in slow motion. Exactly. I want to know how many miles he completes. We're going to probably be on here at least 90 minutes. I want to know how many miles he puts in tonight. I hope he'll let us know. Okay, so here's the story. We, we, there he's back. Um, the story is that we've got two really good presentations. One is going to be by Gavin Myers. We're going to bring him on. He's going to talk to you about uh, what's become once again a relevant topic. For a while there, a lot of practices were trying to get the PPP money. They couldn't get it, and it looked like it was too bad. Too bad. Uh, now we've got round two of that, so this should be uh, particularly relevant more so today than a week ago. So without further ado, I'm going to give you the, uh, our uh, Director of Strategic Development. Uh, good evening, Meyer. everybody. Um, I am going to share my screen with you, so just bear with me. All right, so um, there are a number of programs that have been uh, made available for money for uh, businesses that may need it. And as Tom mentioned, uh, I'm going to be talking about the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, that is a um, federal loan program that's designed to provide an incentive for small businesses to keep their workers on payroll. Um, if this is by the Small Business Administration, well, the loans would be obtained through commercial banks on a first-come, first-served basis. Uh, the program started in the beginning of April with an initial tranche of $350 billion. Uh, it was used in two weeks, so for a while, the would have been moot, but um, the uh, second tranche has been authorized for another $321 billion, uh, with applications having commenced uh, yesterday. Um, this is intended for small businesses affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that would include companies with less than 500 employees, sole proprietors, as well as independent contractors and self-employed individuals. Um, now, a little bit about me. I mean, I guess what, uh, what presentation from someone with a law degree would be complete without uh, some sort of disclaimer. So uh, I'm an attorney by training. I work in-house at Wolfson Eye. I wear two hats. One is a legal hat and the other is a business hat. Um, we recently applied for and received a Paycheck Protection Program loan. And so Tom thought it would be a good idea for me to cover loan program requirements as a service to the community and, and give you a sense for our experience using the program. Um, this is not legal advice, so please consult with your own attorney if you need more information. Um, as far as loan parameters are concerned, um, the loan amount is a function of payroll costs. In essence, you've got to look at two and a half times your average monthly payroll costs from 2019 and the maximum loan amount is $10 million. Uh, it's based on a formula, so there are actual, um, uh, it's, a, it's a formula you have to follow. Your bank may have a loan calculator. Ours did. Uh, it required us to plug in a, a host of information and it came up with the loan amount we were eligible to, to apply for. Um, and essentially it's comprised of wages, salaries, commissions, 
benefits and state and local taxes. The loans mature in two years. Uh, they have an interest rate of 1%. And for the first six months of the loan term, both interest and principal is deferred. Um, after six months, you would essentially pay interest and principal over the remaining 18 months of the loan. Um, the loan process is intended to be streamlined and relatively simple. So there's no collateral that's required, uh, no personal guarantees required. But borrowers do need to make certain written certifications to the lender. One of them is that the current economic uncertainty makes the loan request necessary to support ongoing operations. Um, uh, lend borrowers also have to certify about ownership. So anyone who owns 20% or more of your company is gonna to need to be disclosed in the application to the lender. Um, and this money is not available to private equity funds or their portfolio companies. So if, um, if anyone has undergone a recent transaction, the government expects you to go to your private equity sponsor and not to, uh, to this loan program. Um, because it is intended to cover payroll, um, there is limited permissible use of, uh, of loan proceeds. Um, basically, you have to use them for payroll costs, salaries, commissions, healthcare benefits, and insurance premiums. You can also use it to pay rent and utilities on obligations that were in effect before February 15 of this year. And you can also use it to pay interest on mortgage, mortgage obligations, again on, again on debt that was incurred before February 15. Um, at least 75% of the loan proceeds um, have to be used to pay employee compensation, healthcare, and related expenses. And the remaining 25% can be applied to rent, utilities, and mortgage interest. Um, the application process itself, as I've said, is pretty simple. Um, there are form documents provided by the Small Business Administration and by the commercial bank that you will be working with. Um, the documents are not, uh, not changeable in any fashion. There's no negotiating. You basically, what you see is what you get, and you, it's, a, it's a take it or leave it proposition. Um, our lender did require documentation verifying certain things, including number of full-time equivalent employees, pay rates for everyone, as well as mortgage, lease, and uh, utility obligation information. Um, the application process, because of the program has been rolled out so quickly, um, the, the process does leave some questions open. In particular, there is a blanket agreement to sign more documents in the future, and that is as broad and open-ended as it sounds. So basically, when we obtained this loan, we agreed that whatever documents our lender puts in front of us in the future in connection with this loan, uh, we will essentially sign without question. Um, there were no terms in the loan documents regarding forgiveness. That's obviously a very important component of the program which I'm going to get to. Um, and as far as the forgiveness is concerned, we, we don't know how that's going to work. At a minimum, we know it's going to require some kind of documentation. And we're also going to have to provide written certifications that the documents we present are true and that the funds that we obtain we used appropriately. Um, and in, in the course of applying for the loan, your particular lender could require more information. They have broad discretion to administer the program um, in any way they see fit, as long as it's consistent with existing SBA guidelines. Um, sorry, we have a computer glitch. So as I mentioned, um, a very important, is everyone seeing my screen? I am not at this point. All right, hold on a second. Sorry about this, everybody, I'm having a non-cooperative computer. Can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. Everyone else is on mute except for All right, so um, 
Obviously, a very important element of the program is the fact that the loan is forgivable. So it does sound too good to be true, but in essence, there is free taxpayer sponsored money that is available for your business. And what it does is it gives you an opportunity to float eight weeks of business operations. Now, up to 100% of both principal and interest on the loan is forgivable, as long as you meet certain conditions. Um, one of them is that you have to maintain the 75-25 ratio of employee costs versus other costs. So again, at least 75% of the loan money you receive has to be used to pay your employees and pay benefits. The other 25% can be applied for a limited set of things, meaning rent, utility, and mortgage interest. Um, all the money has to be used within eight weeks of the date of the loan and you have to maintain both headcount and salary levels. So companies that laid off or furloughed work, workers already can take advantage of this loan program as long as they rehire their employees. And any amounts that end up being forgiven will not be considered income. So it really is a phenomenal program to, uh, to enable companies to continue operating at least for a period of time. Um, as I've said, the application process is pretty simple. Um, and I want to touch on some best practices. Um, we expect that there is going to be very strict enforcement and oversight to prevent misuse of the program. I think already you're seeing some of that, some of that in the news reports. Uh, just today, for example, the Treasury Secretary was saying that any loans above $2 million are going to be automatically audited. Um, we have been told to keep meticulous records uh, of how we use uh, the Paycheck Protection Program loan money. Uh, we recommend a, set, a, a set, separate bank account. Um, and we've also prepared a budget which we'll, we'll use to track our use of loan money as we go through it. Um, other things to, to be mindful of is ensure that time periods and loan parameters are strictly observed meaning you have to apply the proceeds within eight weeks to the day of getting of the money hitting your account. And you have to ensure at least 75% goes to employee compensation. Our banker has actually recommended a higher percentage to be safe. Uh, and they re actually recommended that we use 80% for payroll and the 20 rent, remaining 20% for the other stuff. Um, and the money in the first tranche did go very quickly. So if this is something that you would be looking to take advantage of, you need to move quickly and also leverage any existing relationships you have uh, with your bank. Our banker was very helpful and instrumental in, in shepherding us through the process and making sure we got the loan approved. Um, obviously there are risks associated with this. The biggest one being uh, forgiveness or potentially a lack of it. Um, you know, there have been minimal guidelines on, on the forgiveness process or actually what it's going to take to get the loan forgiven. Um, and as I said, we, we've, we've already seen potential abuse, especially by bigger companies. Um, and so we extract, expect strict enforcement um, of any forgiveness requests. Um, and the other thing is to be mindful of, obviously, is to use the proceeds only for allowable purposes. Um, so if you use it for anything other than what it's designated for or in connection with fraud, um, that would obviously be a, a big problem. As with the TARP program back in 2008, um, the government has said that they're gonna, gonna provide strict oversight of the program. Um, any questions? Uh, all right, everybody. So you can um, submit a question if you raise your hand. Gavin, I'm going to unmute you again. And how do you raise your hand, Lauren? I don't know. Maybe Lauren will tell us. I'll put you, I'll unmute you, Lauren, because that's how much I like you. Um, so how do you uh, raise your? I think you can click on your little icon, and you can you can um, signal that you want to talk. Yeah. So if you go to participants. Um, at the bottom of the screen, click on participants, everybody will show up, and then there's three little buttons, invite, mute me, or raise hand. Yes, yeah, so I see a question from Karen Castleberry. That's actually a really good question. She asked, what if we rehire employees at a different pay rate? 
In order to ensure that the loan is forgivable, you have to maintain both headcount as well as um, essentially you have to continue paying your employees at approximately the same salary you have them. Uh, as far as headcount is concerned, um, you have to maintain your average monthly headcount over a period of eight weeks. And they will compare that against the eight week period from January 1, 2020 to February 29, 2020. As far as pay is concerned, you cannot reduce pay of any employee by more than 25%. Guys, I think that's the best way of getting questions is to put it through the chat room. So at the bottom of most screens, there'll be the ability to put chat and type something in. Uh, yes, okay, so what if employees don't wanna come back? We're, we're seeing some of that right now. Um, and, you know, right now we're being flexible with our employees. Um, as a practical matter, if you take the loan money and you expect it to be forgiven, then you kind of got to continue paying your employees, even if they don't return. Um, if you don't pay them and or if you terminate them, you risk running afoul of both the, uh, the headcount and salary requirements of the loan. Next question I'm seeing is what about employees earning over a hundred thousand? Yeah, that's another good question. So for purposes of calculating payroll that, that goes into the loan amount, meaning for purposes of figuring out what is your, what is your payroll you're going to use to calculate the loan amount, any employees earning in excess of a hundred thousand dollars are capped at a hundred thousand dollars. And then as far as actually using loan proceeds to pay them as employees are concerned, only up to $100,000 is forgivable. So if you have an employee earning, let's say $200,000 a year, and you wanna continue paying them, you would only be able to use $100,000 of Paycheck Protection Program money to pay to fund that and to have that forgiven. Now it would be permissible to use the other hundred, another $100,000 of your Paycheck Protection Program money to pay the excess, that just won't be forgiven, and then you're going to have to repay it to your lender over a course of two years at an interest rate of one percent. And, and and to be to be clear, it's not a hundred thousand dollars total. It's an annualized rate of a hundred thousand dollars. Correct. And and Dr. Sadat asked, is a hundred k divided by eight weeks? And it's 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 a hundred thousand dollars on an annualized basis. Uh, so, Joe, if you've got Paycheck Protection Program money in the first wave, how do you maintain number of employees equal to last year if you're still not fully back at 100% capacity? I don't see a way around that, Joe, other than paying people to stay home. If we use a partial loan, are we responsible to pay back just the remaining? Um, I guess I would want a little clarity on, on that question. I mean, you're not obligated to use 100% of the loan proceeds. So if it turns out that you use 50 or 75%, um, I guess you could use the, the remaining for permissible purposes and then you would have to repay it again. Or you just repay it then and there, then there's no interest that's been accrued and, and you know, there's no, no money that's owed. Maurice wants to know, I don't think you answered this one yet, if an employee leaves and comes back before June 30th, so you end up with the same head count, are you still within the guidelines of forgiveness? Say that again, Tom. If an employee leaves and comes back before June 30th, so you end up with the same head count, are you still within the guidelines of forgiveness? Maurice, why don't you unmute and, uh, and clarify that question? Maurice Day, are you here? All right. Uh, if, if, if you have an employee leaving, now, from what I understand, you have to have the same number of headcount at the time of disbursement of the loan as you do have when um, the eight-week period ends. 
So you have to be able to maintain. Now, if there is a lapse in between, someone leaves and comes back, is that still okay as far as getting that well, loan? The number, it's not going to be an absolute number. It's an average monthly number. So, you know, I'm hoping a situation like that would, you know, the average would sort of stay the same. Again, it's not an absolute number. Yeah, but it's comparing my... averages over the eight weeks that you have the loan versus uh -huh. the eight weeks from 1 1 2020 to 2 29 2020. So, uh, because I, my understanding was that it doesn't have to even be the same people after eight weeks as long as it's the same number of people. Is that what your yeah. understanding is? Uh, yes, I, I, that is my, I would agree with that. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, there's a question from Ramesh Patel. Can employer pay more? Can employer pay be more than what it was in January or February 2020, but less than 100K annually? Again, I need a little bit of clarification on that. Can you, can you hear me? This is Ramesh Patel. Yes. Yes, uh, the question is, uh, uh, I'm the only employee of my corporation. If I pay myself more than what I paid uh, in January, February, but it's still less than 100,000 annually, uh, will that be forgiven? Uh, I would expect, Ramesh, that it would, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Well, G G Gavin, isn't the loan amount dependent on the salary from a year ago, correct? Well, it's two and a half times. It's two and a half times the loan amount is two and a half times salary and benefits. So there is some cushion in there. And that cushion is for stuff other than salary and benefits. Yeah, but that's two and a half times one month, correct? No, it's two and a half times. Yeah. It's two and a half times one month. So if you increase your, that's going to be a loan amount. So if you increase your salary a whole lot, it's still, you won't get the loan based on current salary. The loan will be based on the salary a year ago. Yeah, I mean, look, I think I would depend on what the numbers end up being. But the question is, can you pay yourself more than you got paid previously? I would say yes, as long as you're within the other loan period. So, okay, Mike Room has a situation where, um, Mike, I'd say to you, that's a tough question because that, that, is, that is getting at more than just the Paycheck Protection Program. Let's go ahead and read his question. Let's read his question to the group. Well, okay, so his, his comment is, I heard the remark about employees not wanting to come back, maybe of a fear of COVID-19 or just lack of childcare. But what if it is financial? If they claim they make more on unemployment versus their salary, how would you address that situation? Um, I, as I say, I think you're touching on things that are beyond just this, this loan program. I think there are potential employment law considerations there. Um, and I, 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 I'm going to say that's beyond the scope of what we're discussing now. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you on, on that, Mike. Okay, yeah, and Dad, can I ask you to clarify something? Can I ask you to clarify, is the, is the number of employees need to be maintained from the date of disbursement of funds or based yeah. on the calculation of 2019 when you, got, when you did your calculations for the PPP? No, the 2019 number is going to be what your, is, is determines what the loan amount is. As far as headcount is concerned, they're going to look at the eight weeks from the date you get the loan to see what your average monthly pay headcount is over that eight week period. And then they're going to compare it over the eight weeks beginning January 1, 2020 through February 29, 2020. And if your business is seasonal or if there's some issue with that, I think there are some rules and exceptions, but as a general rule, 
you compare the eight weeks from the date you get the loan versus the eight week, the, the sort of the baseline eight week period I just described. Looks like the questions have slowed down. Everybody satisfied with what they've gotten here? I can't hear you. Oh yeah, you're muted. Okay. Well, Gavin, that was that was excellent. I think uh, you covered what people need to know. Uh, unless somebody has a last second question, um, I think uh, Jonathan already gave Joe a lot of praise. Gavin, thank you for all you've done this week, this month. Um, to get us through this. It's really been a lot of work on him and his compatriot, our CFO is named Mark Gilpin. I don't know if he's on the call, but thanks to both of them for all of that. Um, Joe Walrath has taken an interest and responsibility at a level that he absolutely positively did not have to. He's one of the doctors in the practice. He's not one of the administrators in the practice, but he has stepped up to the plate in a way that I appreciate more than I can tell you. A lot of the stuff he's doing is probably stuff I'm supposed to be doing. Oh, did I say that out Definitely. loud? Definitely. Um, and so uh, I want to bring him on and thank him for all he's done. And maybe Jonathan wants to chime in or be satisfied, Jonathan, with having already said that. Um, okay. Um, so anyways, uh, glad to be part of this course. Um, glad to be part of Wolf's and I and, and uh, not out on my own during a time like this. I think uh, I, I also would say that uh, Gavin, I really appreciate everything that he's done because it's been a pretty Herculean task. And uh, overall, the direction of the practice, I think, is, is a good one. And I'm, and I'm happy that we're going to emerge one day uh, on the other side. Um, I was going to uh, actually also... Um, um, <clears throat> Um, Dr. Sadat, I, I know he's been working hard. Um, I know that when he finished his draft for the governor at one o'clock, he immediately jumped to Facebook because I've read a lot of his opinions. So I know he's been really cranking out those. Uh, um, <laughs> which, um, I'm going to start with a slideshow um, and I'm going to uh, start that now. Uh, so... This is kind of a wide ranging slideshow. And I'm gonna, maybe I can figure out how to unmute people here. Can, can everybody see this? Can you see this, guys? Tom, can you see it? Yeah, it's good, Joe. Yes. yes. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, so I'm gonna get started. Um, it's a wide ranging uh, talk, and I'm going to explain where I'm going with this, but it's about the context. First, I think it's helpful. It's been a crazy time to just kind of take a breath and kind of recap exactly how we got to where we are. The challenges that we face, uh, the specific solutions that we have, and how we derive those solutions, and then um, opportunities uh, uh, for improvement, maybe even in, in the long haul. So, without any further ado, uh, review of our experience uh, in the United States uh, and Georgia specifically with COVID-19, projections for what may come to pass, a review of current recommendations and guidelines for practicing in healthcare in Georgia, a summary of the measures of Wolfson Eye Institute to meet the challenges of COVID-19, a look ahead, and I'm also gonna share a stock photo of some guy getting ready to sprint on a beach somewhere. There, there's that part, check that box. So um, cited in this talk, uh, a lot of sources. Um, Whitehouse.gov, Opening Up America, again, Executive Orders, Brian Kemp, which I read in painstaking and nauseating fashion. The American Enterprise Institute with Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who's widely recognized to be really the expert uh, uh, on this issue, the Harvard Global Health Institute, uh, some uh, popular um, uh, magazine sources like Time Magazine, which uh, has an interesting story to tell. CMS, the COVID tracking project, you should go to covidtracking.com. You can see up to the day stats anywhere you want, any state or uh, an aggregate. OSHA, I looked at the American Dental Association. I looked at the American Optometric Association Practice Reactivation Preparedness Guide, CDC, 
not just cleaning and disinfection, but other things. American Academy of Ophthalmology has been a very good source and, and um, would be worth looking at because they've had a ton of publications. But most importantly, pooled experience and guidance from fellow professionals, other practices, uh, competing ophthalmology groups, referring optometry groups, non-referring optometrists, um, dermatologists, lawyers, um, as we're all kind of in this together. And I think utilizing those sources to come up with best practices is going to be important going forward. And certainly in that spirit, anything that we, sh we have, any documents that we've generated in, the, uh, in our response and, and sort of our operations, we'd be happy to share. So um, I'm going to start, I think for the tone, uh, reading a letter from Dr. Park, who's the current president of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And um, so Dr. Park says, um, we are not returning to normal. Uh, the lessons learned from COVID-19 may mean that the normal of January 2020 may never approximate the normal of the future. We will have the SARS-CoV-2 virus with us for years. We will always have the memory of what it means to shelter in place for weeks on end, to furlough staff, and to defer patient care. What we must do now is develop the processes to provide patient care in a new normal. This will not be an issue of waiting for someone to signal all clear and turning on the lights. We'll have to make decisions about protocols for use of PPE, antibody testing of staff, expectations as to social distancing. Make no mistakes, SARS-CoV-2 is still with us. The risk of virus transmission and serious, serious illness or death is still with us. We must be thoughtful and careful for our patients, our staff, colleagues, for ourselves and for our families. Okay, so I think that to me, encapsulates the tone in my mindset. I don't think science is gonna come and save us tomorrow. I think we're gonna be dealing with this and we're gonna be dealing with this long term. And so why don't we just approach it with the idea that some of these changes we're making are gonna be permanent. And that's my mindset. So um, the COVID era begins in the United States. This is from the American College of Surgeons on March 15th in Seattle, all hell was breaking loose. Uh, with nursing home patients and surgeons were facing an explosion. They called on their colleagues in Milan to say, what's going on? How did you manage this? And at that point, 90% of the ICU beds in Milan were filled with COVID patients. And all patients over 80 were automatically labeled DNR. Across the board, if you're 80, we are not going to give you life-saving care if you, if you need it. If, it's, if you need resuscitation. If you're over 70 with significant comorbidity, it is too risky for us to resuscitate you. It's not worth it, your prognosis is too poor. And that's called crisis level care. Um, since then, uh, you can see, th this is data that I uh, compiled into graphs from the COVID tracking project. It's quite accessible. Positive tests in the U.S. starting on March 4th to 425, just uh, this past weekend. And if you look at what happens in Georgia, I labeled when that Seattle phone call happened. And since then, we've had exponential growth as well, up to, uh, say, 22, 23,000 or so confirmed positive cases. Um, this is the data which I think is actually the most helpful. Um, on the left, you have the percentage of positive tests for all tests administered in the state of Georgia from March 18th to April 25th. And I label their various political events like the shelter in place order on the uh, 2nd of, uh, actually it should be on the 20th. No, it's the second, I'm so sorry. It's on the second where it's labeled currently, it's correct. And you see that there's exponential growth and then it starts to level off. You have a little peak there, maybe it's a backlog of testing. And then you see from the 25th into the four days preceding, we actually had a sustained, essentially daily decrease in the number of positive tests. We peaked at 26%, we were at 18% a couple of days ago. Now that's an important number because the World Health Organization says that you really should target having only 10% positive tests. If you have 18%, you're not testing enough. Because it's like they used to say in surgery, if you're not taking out enough normal appendices, you're not doing enough appendectomies because appendicitis kills young people, okay? So the next on the right, it's actually the most encouraging slide that I have shows the daily marginal increase in testing. This means a positive 
um, deviation on the graph means you tested more than the week before. And you can see that the testing is ramping up exponentially. In the last seven days, we had almost 52,000 tests, 72 tests per 100,000 per day. Those are important numbers for various models we'll talk about. So this is the timeline of what's happened in Georgia with executive orders. On 314, state of emergency. That's about when Seattle was getting hammered at the, at the onset. 316, school closures. 323, shelter in place for vulnerable populations. 42, shelter in place for everyone. 420, reopen Georgia. Uh, I should put 423 where he says, ah, I didn't really mean that. Here's a bunch of rules you can't follow. Um, so statewide shelter in place, 42, all residents except if conducting in essential services or engage in minimum basic operations or part of critical infrastructure. And this is that six foot uh, spacing. Now I do list here all the minimum basic operations for, for uh, one reason, even though we are not bound as medical practices by these minimum basic operations, we are specifically actually um, exempt from them in the executive order on the 20th of April. Um, nonetheless, it's our responsibility to, to implement as much as we can, and indeed the, the requirements of our various societies. Um, but if you're the landlord that owns the site where you're practicing, you are bound by this. So you have to be very careful because as landlords, you still have significant liability based on the minimum basic operations um, standard. Uh, this is my favorite executive order, the face mask executive order. This is what I call it, you can wear a mask to SunTrust order. Uh, it says that uh, there was a, a, a code uh, which said you can't wear a mask to conceal your identity, but now you can if your goal is to prevent spread of COVID. 420, 2020, yay, everything's open. Um, and this, we talked about this, uh, how you actually are at risk uh, and bound by the minimum basic operations if you're a landlord and that we should practice in accordance with CDC, blah, blah, blah. Um, 423-2020 is, is um, this is the equivalent of one hand giveth, the other hand taketh away. Because I think um, what happened is when Brian Kemp got pressure from the right and the left and didn't get the presidential approbation, um, he uh, walked it back by making rules and regulations that are essentially legal nightmares to follow. So for example, your salon is supposed to increase physical space between staff and clients. That, that's how can you, how can you do that? Um, so you know, go, it's an interesting read, uh, but just to show you an example of some of the problems, you're not supposed to gather uh, more than 10 people if they're not spaced by six feet, but your restaurants can have 10 patients per 500 square feet. So I, I, I just kind of figured out how that would look if, I assume that patients have mass and take up volume. Um, that seems pretty tough to, 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 to get to 10 people. And then if, you, if your restaurant's not a perfect square, uh, then you have even more problems. So um, anyways, that's just me having fun with uh, uh, regulations. But it, the whole thing is a tangled mess. And to me, it's actually reassuring because it means less people are gonna be out doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. <sighs> okay, so where are we headed? I think that the, probably the best voice on this is Scott Gottlieb at the uh, American Enterprise Institute National Coronavirus Response. This was released the end of March and it was a roadmap to reopening. And, and believe it or not, the gating criteria from whitehouse.gov are largely based on this. I subtitle it 20 pages of sheer depression. Um, we're currently, well, we were phase one, which is slow the spread, social distancing, blah, blah, blah. And the goal is to increase testing capacity, at least here nationally, to 750,000 tests per week. So we'll talk about that. And at that point, once you have enough testing in the population, you can start to then zero in specifically on cases and do contact tracing to, to dampen down the infection completely. So if you assume a population in Georgia of 10.2 million, which is 2015, it's probably not accurate, we should be, we should be doing, based on that data, 23,000 tests per week. Maybe it's 30,000. We did 50,000 last week, so I feel real good about that. Um, we're halfway to the standard that the Harvard uh, people think we need to stop this pandemic, but we're certainly in the ballpark for both of, of those uh, models. So that's 
probably the most reassuring piece of data I can give you about the trajectory of this pandemic. Okay, so <clears throat> slow the spread. Then we have to implement contact tracing, which is really, I don't know where we are with that as a country, but it takes literally hundreds of thousands of people to, to track millions of contacts. As you know, you try to call a patient to have them keep an appointment. It takes an army to get 10 patients to keep their appointment. Imagine contact tracing for millions of people. So I'm wondering where we can find a few hundred thousand people who just lost their job and pay them to do, oh, right, they're everywhere. So this should be quite easy for us uh, with the right leadership and direction to, to be able to pay these people to help us with the next step. Um, triggers for moving to phase two in the American Enterprise Institute, sustained reduction of cases for 14 days. That we did not meet in Georgia before moving to phase two. All people with symptoms can be tested. We may be close to that. All confirmed cases and contacts are actively monitored. I'm not sure we're there. I do know that hospitals are not currently resor resorting to crisis levels of care in our region. So CMS says if you uh, have passed the gating criteria, they recommend at that point you can move to phase one and they give you a link to whitehouse.gov for the gating criteria. And I found this when I hit the, oh, it's a 404 error page not found. Um, so right away I was feeling good about our government, but then I went and I actually went to whitehouse.gov and I used a very powerful light <clears throat> and using that very powerful light, I could find the gating criteria. Downward trajectory of flu like illnesses, number one, um, for 14 days. I don't know if we've met that for 14 days, but I know oh, it's certainly been below baseline for a week and a half or two. We can talk about that. It's problematic because people are staying the heck away from doctors. So if you got a flu-like illness, you're not going to go to the doctor. Are you kidding me? Uh, downward trajectory of documented cases within 14 days or downward trajectory of positive tests as a percent of total tests within 14 days. We probably were eight or nine days when Kemp made that executive order. So it's a little premature, uh, but nonetheless heading in that direction. And we're not uh, treating patients with crisis care. Um, we talked about that. This is our map of downward cases as a percent of total. Uh, I showed you that. If trends continue, we would be meeting that today. I expect we are. Hospitals, yeah, 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 yeah. So the trends are good, but we haven't had enough data to definitively say that this is a responsible decision. I don't think the governor's move was crazy, but it's definitely a gamble without a full data set. Well, with the caveat that the part about opening tattoo parlors and fitness centers is crazy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just uh, draw a line there. So what happens if we're wrong? Uh, then we can think about Hokkaido, the cost of being wrong. This was in Time Magazine. So this was uh, the Japanese island, a couple million people. And um, this is a lesson, maybe a lesson Dr. Kent, he may, uh, Brian Kent, he may discover, rediscover asymptomatic transmission because what happened is Hokkaido was initially a model for how to contain and eliminate coronavirus. And they got this down after three weeks of serious lockdown. They got it down to like one new case a day. And um, agriculture and tourism were, were really creamed uh, as a consequence and businesses were getting antsy and they lifted the restrictions. And so when they lifted the restrictions, it was like the Wizard of Oz are like, ding dong, the witch is dead, da, 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 da. and they all went out like three day weekend, schools reopened, and uh, literally 26 days later, they were back on lockdown, and now they're still in lockdown, and all the economic pain of their first lockdown was for naught. And so we might be recapitulating that mistake in Georgia. My only quibble with, well, my real quibble with with the executive orders and news conferences is the tone needs to be a little more severe because we can't all just rush back out. Another word of caution, and this I take from your own society, practice reactivation preparedness guide. It starts by saying this pandemic by all accounts is a temporary event. I will tell you there are many accounts that disagree with that. And I think that's the wrong spirit with which to approach the modifications you're gonna to need to your life your practice, your livelihood, everything. I think this is totally unfounded and a dangerous precedent. We don't know if recovered patients develop lasting immunity. Coronavirus mutates. 
we may have a treatment, which we don't, but it may not last. We have no vaccine. Uh, I know other viruses, we don't have vaccines that we've been looking for for literally decades. We have no good treatment for active disease. We do not have adequate contact tracing. We might have a new strain every year like the flu, okay? So I would say to assume this is gonna peter out is, uh, I would sure love that to be the case, but I don't have confidence in that. I also don't have confidence that science is gonna shoot a bow and arrow into the middle of it and just take it apart. I'm not sure. So expect this to change your practice for years and might as well make these changes permanent because two years of changes, it's pretty much permanent. So uh, now that I'm, I'm done and I, I was only partially on the stove box, uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the multi-agency and society recommendations that we're basing our action plan at Wolfson Eye on. They're widely overlapping, they're very similar. American Academy of Ophthalmology has been prolific. I find their publications to be the most useful. And these guidelines combined with discussions with regional practices, lawyers, optometrists, ophthalmologists, dermatologists, plastic surgeons, surgical centers, hospitals, has informed our own guidelines. Your society recommends developing standard operating procedures that are very well documented. And I think that's really important because there's going to be some liability here. Um, develop processes for sterilization. This is all from your action plan from your society. Try to improve your HVAC system, reduce volume, use telehealth, virtual care whenever possible. Keep inventory, ensure appropriate PPE, limit guests, keep people out who don't need to be out. And then there's a lot of sort of squishy stuff, like figure out if the door is gonna be locked to limit entrance, or on the other hand, keep it wide open so that there's fresh air. I mean, this is gonna be a work in progress. And so I think your standard operating procedure should have a 1.0 and a 2.0 and a 3.0 because you're gonna change every day. Messaging to patients, how are we gonna keep this? Hey Joe? Safe? Yeah. Hey Joe, why don't you explain why the HVAC is important? Well, you can take viral filters, uh, viral particles. So in a surgical center like our ASC, um, our ASC exchanges the air in the room 15 to 20 times per hour, complete exchange. And if you wait 15 minutes, that means that 99.9% .9 of virus is gone if you exchange the air. And then the filter itself, uh, you know, it's just like the, the viral particle itself is about one micron. If you have a high quality filter, you can actually filter the virus out. That's why they say if you're on an airplane and you're in the back seat and someone's got COVID in the front seat, you're very low risk to get it because of the quality of the HVAC system in airplanes. Is that anything else, John? Did, Jonathan, did I miss uh, what you wanted? That's uh, good, Joe. Okay, I thought, you, I thought you might have fallen off the treadmill again, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna pay for that. Okay, so CMS recommendations. Um, uh, things that I've plucked from CMS, I haven't listed everything here from CS, CMS or OSHA or anyone because I've, all of these are pooled and a lot of these recommendations are in multiple sources. They say consider establishing non-COVID care zones that screen patients. For example, screening patients outside of your waiting room. Um, every effort should be made to conserve PPE. The funny thing is JCO used to tell us that a hot joint uh, um, whatever, blah, 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 for accreditation of hospitals used to tell us, change your PPE every time you turn around. Now they're like, never change your PPE. Uh, so uh, how the times have changed. Um, patients should wear a cloth face mask. Use telehealth and virtual care. You can see how to take PPE on and off properly on the CDC website. AAO recommendations, be wary of conjunctival secretions which can harbor virus. Um, they also say that SARS-CoV-2 is susceptible to the same treatments we normally do to disinfect our office. Social distancing, facial coverings, disinfection, COVID screening prior to waiting rooms, keep the waiting room socially distant, keep vulnerable patients away, slit lamp barriers, no talking during the slit lamp examination and wear proper PPE, N95 gown gloves, face shields for treating COVID positive patients or send them to someone who can. AAO has a uh, guide to physical modification of the office, office space. It is really common sense. Uh, we've thought of these things before we even saw this, this publication. Eliminate high risk surfaces. No more coffee machine, no more water machine, no more magazines, no tables. Space out the chairs. Protective screens in front of the uh, testing equipment, front desk, slit lamps, floor markers, proper ventilation, signage from the CDC, hand sanitizer deployment. I have to be careful. You can't 
you can't deploy hand sanitizers that people can put in their pocket because you will have them for about a half a clinic. So you need to get something that's wall mounted. Uh, try to eliminate shared workstations. This is all sort of common sense stuff. Um, CDC, um, as I said, their guidance has been incorporated into really everything that, uh, that I'm talking about. So uh, I, I put here procedural modification 7.0 because it seems like we've been uh, working on these um, working on these around the clock for, for a couple of weeks now. So I'm just going to review sort of what our approach is and how we're going to move forward really starting Monday. Our guiding principles, we're going to offer the highest level of care. We're going to adopt aggressive measures that are certainly consistent with community standards or beyond. We're going to reassure our patients, but also our staff with the safety and efficacy of our efficiency of our environment, improve communication with durable teaching materials like video and printed materials so we can still connect with our patients even without them being in front of us in clinic. So before they come to the office, the patients are given a lot of different methods for receiving registration paperwork, ideally electronic, and ideally they return it electronically. The least uh, exchange between staff and patients the best, just like it's better to, to pay with a credit card than it is to pay cash. Our calls to the patients will do the history taking, chief complaints, medication updates, other charts before their visit. They'll be administered a COVID screening questionnaire if their appointment's within a week of the scheduling. We have patient instructions we're gonna communicate and expectations for the visit. Our call center has a script to read. The patient instruction says you're gonna wear a face mask. If you don't have one, we're gonna give you one. You should arrive alone maybe one essential guest at most. Arrive outside to the designated location where your COVID questionnaire will be administered. Proceed to a temperature screening. If your temperature is less than 99.5, you get a sticker that says your name and you head to the waiting room, we escort you there. Why do you need a sticker with your name on it? Because everyone's wearing a mask. And so Mrs. Johnson, our 69 year old lady with hard of, he hard of hearing, you call her seven times in the waiting room and she's still out there. And then 45 minutes later says, nobody called me. Now she's got a mask on. So yeah, Ms. Johnson needs a name tag. Okay, uh, the instruction sheet, blah, blah, blah. How about this, shut off face ID. If you're wearing a mask, you gotta keep your mask on. Wear your name tag at all times. Don't bring food or liquid, because you can't drink food. Well, you can't drink food anyways, but you can't eat food or drink liquid without taking your mask off. Don't bring extraneous stuff in the office. Don't move the chairs, they're spaced the way they are for a reason. No standing, sit unless you're at the check-in counter and try to limit cash transactions. Um, unless there's an urgent need, know that you will not be seen if you have a positive screening questionnaire, you have a temperature greater than 99.5, or you fail to comply with our safety measures, and we'll give you resources that you need if you fail our screening measures. Passive physical measures. We've got to imagine this is a long haul, and eventually, maybe, we're going to get a little soft. The most passive measures, the best. Remove extraneous furniture, cluster the chairs, permanent barriers, wide deployment of sterilium hand rub dispensers, signage, dispersion of testing equipment into regions with better ventilation with possible. And because at Wolfs and I, we have uh, five different offices, we're gonna have to have site-specific customization of these guidelines. Uh, our active, those are passive. Our active safety measures, don't share pens, wipe down clipboards. We have someone who's gonna be identified as the hygiene monitor in our clinic and walk around with a spray bottle and two tablespoons of bleach in a quart and clean all the surfaces, help make sure everyone's socially distant, help with the temperature screening, help with the flow of the clinic to keep people away from each other into the exam room and then out of the office. The examination will be fairly silent at the silt lamp, questioning and discussion at a safer distance. Exam rooms are gonna remain open for ventilation. Each technician ideally will be in their own room so there's less cross technician contamination or potentially risk. Uh, limitation of congregation of staff. Surgical scheduling is a meet and greet affair now. They're not gonna sit down and talk about surgical quotes and blah, 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 that's gonna be done over the phone. And some of us uh, of the practice have been working on video counseling, high quality video production so that we can uh, offload some of the surgical discussion with the idea that, look, if that's not enough, and if you feel like you have questions, let's do a telemedicine follow-up. And for me, inoculoplastics, I've done some telemedicine, probably 30, eh, I've signed up 30 surgeries in the past uh, month and a half. I've had about 60 telemedicine visits. I find patients to enjoy them. 
actually, they don't have to go drive to the office. They don't have to sit in the waiting room. And, you know, occasionally I do need to bring them in for a test or to see them for a specific consideration. But in general, it's been very well received. Uh, we talked about the hygiene monitor, blah, 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 blah. Staff hygiene. Staff wear scrubs to work, take them off, put them in a bag, and wear your jeans home. Staffs do not touch a patient without gloves. They wear medical masks at all time, eye protection, shut off your face ID, wash your hands every time you touch or remove your PPE, keep your mask on until break time and don't touch it. Wipe down your devices. Forms and documents, we have a lot of them, and again, happy to share them with you. Messaging to patients, how are we keeping you safe? Call center script, how we're keeping our patients safe. This just is meant to uh, reassure patients. Uh, COVID uh, screening questionnaire, uh, instructions that are going to be sent to the patient at the time of their appointment. Call center script, what they say when, uh, when there's a phone call. Uh, what are the opportunities uh, with uh, sort of our new fresh approach to uh, clinical ophthalmology? Uh, well, I think in some ways the patient experience is going to be improved because what do patients really care about a lot? They care about wait time, whether well, there ain't going to be no wait time. Offloading history and, and paying closer attention to the flow of clinic is going to reduce wait time significantly. For oculoplastics, patients love telemedicine if it's zero wait time, zero travel time. And we just you shoot the breeze. Durable instruction materials the patient can access anytime. We are uh, working on that to make that, um, to make that better for patients. Um, and while we have reduced volume, we're incorporating improved electronic medical records and practice management software, leading to improved communication with patients and referring doctors. Uh, a renewed sense of caring and an improvement in our environment, focus on safety and well-being of staff and patients. And we're also going to be very receptive to taking our 7.0 manual and making it 7.1 and 7.2 by getting feedback, 360 degree feedback from technicians, from front desk, from patients, from other staff. Um, we might just appreciate our role in the greater healthcare community more as we work with our affiliates, referral sources, direct competitors, non-eye care practice. We continue to develop and hone best practices. And um, maybe, and I think maybe I'm speaking personally, we don't have all the answers as we frantically run around pushing patient after patient to our offices. And maybe this has been a useful time for reflection. So... I hope my mic was on for that whole thing. <laughs> I unmuted everybody. Sorry. And I'm going to regret that. I'm going to mute everybody again. Um, does anyone have any thoughts or questions you can chat? And I will uh, pick up that thread. So, so, so any chat questions? Yeah. Um, thoughts on wearing gloves. My thought is yes, wear gloves. That's my thought. Excellent uh, answer. You know, I, I do a lot of tear, gain, tear drain, uh, probing, chalazian procedure, stuff like that. I know there's COVID in the conjunctival secretions. Um, I don't know when the last time you've done a slow lamp exam and not touched the eyelid margin, either with a Q-tip or your finger. <clears throat> so you should definitely uh definitely wear gloves steve yeah. wilson wants to know what is your definition of essential eye care uh, essential eye care i think you would have to say largely falls on trauma serious infection uh significant glaucoma problems corneal ulcers um, retinal uh, uh macular degeneration treatment uh malignancy orbital tumors um, dacrocystitis, um, certain neonatal issues, um, congenital ptosis where there's a threat of amblyopia. Um, and I'd be happy to hear whatever anyone else likes to add to that. Well, presbyopia, of course. Presbyopia, even, uh, you know, one or two diopters of astigmatism. I, Chris Hoskins says, my staff prefers pleated surgical style masks because they are significantly inferior 
are they significantly inferior to the N95 masks we have? Absolutely. They're, 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 they're far inferior, but they're far better than nothing. But here's the better point. What mask is your patient wearing? Okay, because to be honest with you, the masks are to prevent the asymptomatic spreaders. So you put a mask on, it sends a message, and I'm definitely wearing a mask because it may give me a couple more percent protection, but my patient's going to have a mask. You better believe. In fact, I'm going to do surgery with my patients in a mask. It's not going to look good. Eric Colgrove, who has left town, but we still love, says, will you email your slides to everyone as well as the forms you're using? I'm going to answer that question. Anyone who wants whatever they want, send me an email, and I'll get you what I can get you. And the answer is, that's pretty much a yes. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Do you allow patients to come in without masks? Do you provide if they do not comply yes. with instructions given? Yes. Prior yeah, to no, no one's going to be, there will be no occupant of any of our suites without a mask, whether they are the doctor, the technician, the front desk, or the patient, or the patient's guest. And, and I should also point out that the patient's guest is going to be screened and non-contact temperature assessed as well, not just the patient. As well as the doctors and staff. I mean, we're yeah, every day, doctors and staff, there's a logbook for that. There's somebody named Kelly who's asking the question, what mask will you put on your patient if they don't have one? I don't know who this Kelly person is. <laughs> well, well, so, uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be one of our normal uh, medical masks. And um, I would, ones. Yeah, and so and I would go so far as there are some with the adhesive across the bridge of the nose and cheek. When I do surgery, upper lid surgery, my patients are going to be wearing those. Are you utilizing plastic face screens along with masks? The answer to that is we have face shields, which are not disposable, which are reusable. We have, we have ordered about 100 of them, 150 of them. Therefore, one, every employee gets one of those. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to use it, but I'm going to try. But I will be wearing my safety glasses at all time, and I will have my AirPods in at all times. So I don't put stuff next to my face. So AirPods, safety glasses, and mask, and scrubs. And we'll be having the, the shields at the slit lamp as well. Slit lamp barriers, yeah. Yeah. Well, we seem to have run out of questions. Jonathan, do you have anything else you'd like to say to our guests? No, I just uh, encourage everyone to uh, to stay safe and, and take these precautions. Uh, the one thing that I think the, the biggest take home for me would be, this is not going away. I, I really believe we're going to be seeing ebbs and flows for the next two years or 18 months, whatever it is. But this is a long-term uh, uh, change that we're making. And the way we counsel patients, the amount of time you have face-to-face, whether you're you know, not talking to them when you're so close face to face is just really important. And a good reminder of that is, you know, the first doctor in Wuhan province in, in China that raised the alarm, who got into trouble and then eventually was vindicated. He was an ophthalmologist and he contracted the virus and died. So this is, this is real. This is, and he was young. He wasn't a, a 80 year old with several comorbidities. I believe he was in his 40s and, yeah, and, right. and, healthy, and healthy. And so that is rare. Most of the time, mm. people are older. But I think when you're that close, you can get a, a bigger viral load. And if you get a big viral load, then younger people are much more susceptible. So I just encourage everyone to take this seriously, figure out what your protocols are going to be, and then make sure you adhere to them. A question just came in for Dr. Wolfson. How many miles did you blog on the treadmill? Not enough, not enough. Okay. Hmm. Another question is the face shields are not working in our office. They fog up, can't communicate on phone. There's no question mark, but what advice would you offer, Dr. Walra? Try a different face shield. <laughs> where, where you could wear safety glasses. Safety glasses. Okay. You know, I mean, safety glasses is better than nothing. I got to believe that. Yeah. Dr. Kazem, I don't think uh, he has AirPods. He's asking AirPods question mark. I think oh, I already, I sent that back to him with the private answer. It's connected to my iPhone oh. so that 
when I have the uh, urgent call from the referring doctor, I can take it without putting my phone up to my face. It would just be like, you know. Very good. Be always standing by to take your call. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, you guys will get zero credit hours for the, uh, for the hour and a half, you, or hour and 15 minutes that you've spent with us. Um, we will do an update of this course in the next few weeks, and it will hopefully be with CE credit, almost for sure uh, be with CE credit. Um, also, we have recorded this event, and we'll let people know where they can go to, uh, to review it. And uh, obviously, some of the people that uh, were invited didn't make it. But we did have a nice uh, crew show up. We had about 75 of you, so thanks for joining us. And just let us know how we can help you. And thanks for supporting us. And good luck out there. And be safe. Yeah, be safe, everybody. <laughs>